I just finished my first week of what's meant to be an eight week cycle. I would leave right now if I could just take off through the trees and hope for the best, but I can't, not without Alabama. She's my border collie, a rust colored ball of energy named not after the state, but Patricia Arquette's character in True Romance. And now she's gone and I'm all alone in the tower in the woods. But no, I'm not alone. Those things are out there. So here we are. The final words of a failed screenwriter, Mike Bradbury, 26, of Sound Mind. And body, I don't know where to start. It's confusing. Overwrought, some might say. I could tell you about him, the man who hired me. But he's in lockdown. No contact for eight weeks. So what good would that do? I won't start with the survival guide I found in the tower, either. We'll get to that in due time. I promise. But not yet. I don't want to confuse you. Confusing you will only make things harder, so I'll start with the most unconfusing thread in this impossible tale, the beginning. It started two months ago with Craigslist, the home of locked iPads, strange sexual encounters, serial killers, and human traffickers. I'd read enough creepy pastas to know better than to go job hunting online. But then again I was penniless, living at home, and desperate as all hell. Six months prior, I had fled west with Hollywood in my eyes and dreams of becoming a screenwriter in my head. I had survived all of three months before my lack of employment forced me home with my tail between my legs. Home, Roanoke, Virginia, where dreams go to die. Mom and dad were overjoyed when I asked if I could stay with them for a while. They hadn't wanted me to go west in the first place. That was the most crushing of all, hauling my luggage upstairs and settling back into the old life I was supposed to have left behind. It's not their fault I'm here, that's important to know. I didn't need to get a job, they weren't asking for rent, and telling me to get paid or get out. They welcomed me with open arms, the best parents in the world, but my ego was wounded. I was a bona fide failure, the one who couldn't crush it in the big city, and the last thing I wanted to be, even more than a failure, was an unemployed 26 year old living with mommy and daddy. So I went around to local businesses, with my credentials, pitching myself like a door-to-door -door salesman flogging his wares. Unfortunately for the businesses of Roanoke, Virginia, they weren't buying my brand of BS. Three weeks of that, and I found myself, surprise surprise, an unemployed 26 year old still living with mommy and daddy. I tried to reconnect with some of my old friends, but all of them had moved away and started their lives. I had officially become that guy who never left his hometown. Then, like a kiss from God, I stumbled over the bizarre ad, the one that read, simply and strangely, seeking a partner for rapture, the one will be compensated handsomely, rapture a feeling of intense pleasure, or joy. Despite that, I figured it was meant in the biblical sense, I, not a sex thing, and I doubted if some Craigslist deviant would include quoted scripture and pictures of God's disciples in his online posting. Sure, there were plenty of red flags. Oh, say, the endless quotes about God smiting down the Sodomites, and the sinners, and the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. I didn't see any of it. Hell, the fine prank could have read seeking the organ between your legs for consumption, and I would have glossed right over it. The only words I saw were compensated handsomely. After a brief internal debate, I called the number at the bottom of the ad. It rang twice. Hello, answered a voice that was deep and stuffy, like the man on the other end had just been torn from sleep. I was silent. I hadn't thought about what I might say if anyone picked up. I cleared my throat. Yeah, hi, my name is Mike. I'm calling for, I realized I didn't know his name. There hadn't been one on the ad. I'm calling about the online ad. The man on the phone brightened. Yes, yes, of course. Are you interested in the position? Well, I wasn't sure. What exactly is the position? There wasn't much information on the post. He chuckled, right? I'm sure you're awfully confused. But, as I hope you'll understand, I prefer not to discuss these things over invisible air. I know it's terribly secretive, but I assure you everything is quite kosher. He sounded scholarly, intelligent, not at all like the fervent Jesus freak I'd been expecting. The word erudite sprang to mind. He sounded sane. I felt my shoulders relax as he continued. Do you know where Eagle Rock is? He asked, thereabouts, off Route 20 is a little diner, dreadful eggs, but the pie isn't exactly a sin against pastries. How about you and I meet there for lunch, say, 1 o'clock tomorrow, 
I'll tell you all about the position, and if it isn't to your liking, I'll cover your guess and throw in, how about a hundred dollars for your troubles? The word yes tickled at my lips, scraping to get out. The whole arrangement sounded good, maybe too good, but then again, what was the harm? I hesitated and blew out my reply in a burst of air. Yes, I said, one o'clock works, splendid. I forgot to ask, what's your? The line had gone dead. Name, I finished with no one to answer. Duty's diner was, what a writer more eloquent than I might call, in the middle of nowhere. It was a chrome dining car, skin fleet, sign rusty, sitting in the back of a wide, asphalt lot. It sat just off the highway, framed by a wall of trees, its lot mostly empty spare a few long haul trucks, and scattered pickups. Confederate flag bumper stickers were abundant. I rolled my eyes, and checked my watch, 15 minutes to 1, 14. By the time I stepped into duties, and was met with the smell of grease, and the lovely jukebox tunes of bygone eras. It was a dive, silk windows, strange taxidermy critters garnishing the walls, sunburned ass cracks smiling at me from stools lining the counter, a few elderly waitresses who looked like anti-smoking public service announcements dashed around, refilling coffee cups, jotting down orders. I scanned the booths, looking for one to claim. That's when I saw him, the man I was here to meet, tucked into the back corner. I don't know how I knew it was him, I just did. His height struck me first. I could tell he was tall, skeletal, even though he was seated. The next thing I noticed were his clothes. He wore some kind of grease-stained jumper, something you might see on the back of a malnourished smelter in photos of the Soviet reign, or on Michael Myers, and he was watching me. I looked away like a child caught staring and pretended to scan the specials. Even still, I could feel his eyes crawling over my skin, watching me like two bright animals over the rim of his newspaper. They were serving tasty good cherry pie I noted with no real interest. I was, you must be Mike, said a voice, the words laced through with a slight English accent that had been lost over the phone. I looked up, Kent Aberdeen, the man who would be my employer, towered over me. He was older than I'd initially thought, late 50s, early 60s, face bracketed in deep lines, hair salted, and thinning. He smiled. It lit up his face like a Klieg spotlight. Please join me. I ordered us coffee. And pie, I hope you don't mind. My voice wouldn't come at first. That's fine, I said finally. We spoke for the better part of an hour. He told me about the small fortune he'd made trading futures overseas, about how he'd come to America when he'd gotten a sign about the coming end. He said my job would be simple. I'd be living in the tower for eight weeks, and that was all I had to do. He didn't seem crazy. He made it all sound so rational, logical, rooted in reality. Of course, it was ridiculous, the ramblings of an unstable mind, but when he told me the insane amount I'd be getting paid, I was willing to deal with a little crazy. Plus, as he was quick to point out, there would be power so I'd have access to my devices. If I brought my own Wi-Fi router, I don't understand, I asked finally. What do you need me for? He smiled. I hardly venture out. I'm a bit of a recluse, if you believe it. He chuckled at his own expense. I want someone, someone I can trust, watching over me. It makes me feel safe. You're not the first person I've hired, nor would you be the last. Eight weeks is all I ask, and if thereafter you find yourself willing to continue, that can be discussed. He wasn't telling me something. I knew that for certain, but I brushed it off, blinded by the dollar amount, and it didn't sound so bad. A dose of nature with my dog by my side. Assuming, you know, he allowed the dog. Are you a religious man, Michael? He asked. I was as secular as they come, which I think showed on my face because it split into a wide smile. Neither am I, he said, but the listing. Ah, yes, the online advertisement. I figure if someone's not turned away by that schlock, they must be serious. So, he said, tenting his fingers. Are you serious? I won't be offended if you decide to decline the position. I understand it's unorthodox. I finished my coffee and looked at him. One thing, I said, I have a dog. His smile cut me off. It was wide, toothy, full of good cheer. I love dogs, he said. I don't need to tell you what my answer ended up being. I met him at duties the next day with my suitcase in hand and my affairs in order. Alabama accepted approximately 600 head scratches from Kent before we set out in his pickup. Alabama between my feet, my suitcase, in the bed. 
we drove through scroll of access roads, dense woods blurring by. As we drew deeper into the wilderness, he asked, if I wouldn't mind putting on a blindfold. People pleaser as always, I did. I figured if he tried anything, Alabama would tear his throat out. Was the blindfold laced in something? I'll never know. However, soon after it graced my eyes, I crashed into a deep, restless sleep. Alabama was licking my face. Her leash was roped around my ankle, and where the screw was I. Late afternoon sunlight slanted through the trees as I grimaced and looked around. Wood snarled and around a thin clearing from which a repurposed fire watchtower grew like a wooden fist. It was a single room cabin elevated high above the tree line by a network of stilts. A staircase tied it together, circling the infrastructure as it spiraled up to the cap. The bottom was fenced in, and beneath it, beside a growling generator and humming septic tank, was a reinforced bunker door planted firmly into the forest floor. Christ, I muttered. Alabama nosed at my hand, and I stroked her absently as I saw there was no pickup truck and no Kent Aberdeen. There was nowhere to go but up. All right, I sighed. Come on. I grabbed my suitcase, the massive bag of kibble, and, with Alabama leading the way, mounted the stairs and trudged up the countless creaky steps that led to my new digs. The cabin was wide and spartan, its walls wrapped in windows which splashed buckets of sunlight over a bed, a desk, a toilet, a fridge, and a shelf fitted with enough canned goods to survive the apocalypse. I kicked off my shoes and collapsed on the bed. It wasn't exactly memory foam, but it would do just fine. Alabama jumped up beside me and curled up into a panting ball of ruddy fur. Yeah, I said, it's not much, I know, but I felt something hard and square dig into my leg from beneath the blankets. I rooted around and came up with a battered composition notebook. Okay, I said, turning it over in my hands. It was frayed, its binding abused. I carefully peeled back the cover and read, first with confusion, then mounting dread, what waited for me inside. There were no names, no dates, merely a strange list scrawled in different hands, as if compiled by multiple people. It reads as follows, this is not a joke. If you're reading this, it means he's gone and you're alone. This list is incomplete. I doubt very much if it will ever be complete. There are things out there we might never know about, for good reason. Your job is to add to this list, if at all possible. Your job is to survive the night. Godspeed. One of you see a hiker, kill him before he kills you. He is an imitator. He is not human. He wants your flesh for a new husk. If you get his blood on you, wash it off immediately. Two, if you see something peering through the tower windows at night, ignore it. It will go away. If you meet its gaze, it will take that as an invitation. Then you're in serious trouble. Three, beware the wicked ones. I've only seen them once. I'm not sure what purpose they serve. They haven't bothered me. Four, violently scribbled out. Five, something screams through the woods on most nights, always past 3 a.m. Not sure what it belongs to, what it wants. Six, avoid the tree talker at all costs. It's long, gangly, bark-like, changes shapes, and moves like vines. Carry the megaphone at all times, and if you see one key the microphone next to speaker, high frequency will drive it off. Seven something brings gifts, unsure what it is. Found mangled animals, bloody scraps of fur at the tree line. We'll update later. Eight an illegible smudge, like it had been erased. The list ended abruptly. Six rules to survive the night. I reread the words in the notebook again and again, hoping I'd miss some indication of this clearly sick joke. But no, no joke, no gimmick, just six rules. By the time the severity of the list had settled into my gut in a ball of dread, the evening red of the west had doused my world in shadow. It would soon be nightfall. I couldn't sleep the first night. I tossed and turned and reread the notebook, and tried to convince myself it was a prank, an awful, mean prank, but I knew deep down it wasn't. Alabama groaned and whined and told me to get to bed, but I couldn't. I kept the lights on for a while, but that just turned the world beyond the windows black, like I was in a dark chasm, where horrible things slithered and writhed. Finally, I killed the lights. I sat there in the darkness for a while. Your job is to survive the night. An eternity later, I fell asleep. I woke to the high, anxious whine buried deep in my dog's throat. What is it, girl? I groaned as I sat up. It was still dark out, darker than before. A dead night, one where no moon nor her galaxy of suitors dare emerge. Then I heard it on the window just behind me. 
Tap, tap, tap. I slowly turned. My neck prickled with dread. My stomach curled with nausea. I looked out into the night, and something looked back. I gasped, and yanked the blanket up over my eyes. It was almost comedic. A child spooked by the noise in his closet. I grabbed my dog and stuffed her under the covers. I sat there for a moment, listening to my ragged breath, slowly inflating and deflating the blanket shield and the quiet growl, brewing in Alabama's throat. I thought about it, the impossible it, the thing, bony and dreadful, looking in at me, its head as big as the cabin, its eyes as big as doors, pale and milky and full of dumb hunger. I could feel it, like its presence, was a malignancy radiating caustic heat through the walls. I knew it was watching me, watching me with sick knowledge, waiting for me to let it in. Tap, 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 the sound of a long, knife-like fingernail scraping glass. Alabama yelped. I pressed her tight against my chest as a dull ache settled into my teeth as my stomach knotted up. Tap, 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 I held my breath, afraid that if it heard me breathe its massive hand made of stiff bones and dead skin would crash through the roof and steal me off into the night. Tap, tap, tap. I waited and waited and waited and, silence, I listened, breath baited, heart pumping a hot rush of blood and adrenaline through my veins. I sat that way, blanket wrapped over my head, Alabama pressed to my chest until sunlight stole the darkness and daylight banished all things that went tap. At first light, I marched down the stairs and pounded on the bunker door until my fist was bloody and my voice was raw. Tend Aberdeen, if he heard me, did not reply. Noon came and went as I banged, and screamed and told him I wanted to go. I wasn't in a rational state of mind. I could have set out on my own, taken off through the trees, with my dog leading the way, but I was blinded by images of it. That day was a blur of hysterics, and hardly warded off exhaustion. I hadn't slept and it was taking its toll. I was cracking. I don't remember falling asleep but it must have been early evening, when my body had just powered off. When I woke up, it was nearly dark and Alabama was gone. That was a week ago. I spent my days wandering the woods, screaming her name, and my nights huddled on the mattress. I moved beneath the small wooden bed. I hear things some nights, whispers, cries, but have yet to see another horror. I don't know if I'm crazy, if that thing was just a figment of my tired mind, or if it was as real as you or me. Either way, I can't leave. Not yet. Not until. I have to go. There's someone here. He was calling up at me from below the tower. A lost imitator hiker. I ignored him, but he won't go away. Now I can hear his footsteps thump thumping up the tower stairs. I can hear him coming for me. He'll be here any second. Wish me luck. 1. If you see a hiker, kill him before he kills you. He is an imitator. He is not human. I crouched beneath the window, by the door and waited. I could hear the hiker's footfalls creaking up the wooden stairs, step after step, flight after flight. My breath felt hot and gluey in my throat. I tasted mold. I saw galaxies of dust swirling in shafts of sunlight. I tightened my grip on the fire extinguisher as the footsteps stopped just outside the door. I held my breath and watched a shadow wipe across the window. My heart pulsed forward, stopped, and lurched along to make up for the missing beat. A shape filled the glass just above me. I could see the man, late forties, balding, khaki shorts, and a sun-faded tee, cupping his hands to the grimy pane as he peered into my cap. He stood there a moment, staring, eyes lingering over every nook and cranny of the claustrophobic space. Then he spoke, hello. A wave of relief washed over me. He was normal. He had to be. Things that pretended to be men didn't sound like your dad. My grip on the fire extinguisher relaxed. My shoulders rolled back with relief. Then he spoke again. His voice, cold and cruel, cut through the glass like the rattle of bones. I see you. I looked up. He was staring right at me. His hands crashed through the window and fell together around my neck. I screamed as he tore me into the wall. I felt its sledge hammer into my back and drive out all the air. I wheezed and swung the fire extinguisher blindly. It met his forearm with a sickening crackle. His arm buckled as the bone holding it together snapped like a rotting twig. But he didn't lose his grip, it tightened. I swung over my shoulder and missed as he chuckled something in my ear. I didn't hear it. I couldn't hear anything over the hot roar of blood through my ears. The sound of the curtains of my life slowly closing, closing like the darkness 
that swallowed the corners of my vision. The room blurred and flared around me. I was weightless. My strength was flagging. I was dying by the hand of the imitator, who throttled me through broken, jagged glass, the glass which bit into his arms and tore back bleeding snarls of flesh. Then my grip found the black hose, the one strapped to the body of the fire extinguisher like a dead snake. An idea clipped through me with a bolt of adrenaline. I planted my feet and threw myself back. That moment is a blur. I remember hitting the glass and crashing through it. I remember a million scintillating shards tumbling down like snow made of diamonds. His grip left my neck. I sawed air through my lungs as I felt my feet hit solid ground. Lose it before my ass went thudding to the wooden catwalk surrounding the cabin. I lurched to my feet, hose in hand, and scanned the ground for the imitator whose throat would soon know the taste of flame retardant. I was going to jam it down his mouth and pump him full like a foie gras duck. He wasn't there. I stood alone for one confusing instant before I heard a distant crack. It came from below. I inched toward the tower's railing and peered down at the ground. I saw a red smear. I saw a broken, folded up thing, a rag doll that was once a man, or once something that looked like one. The imitator was dead, so that was that. I stood like that for a while, just staring, watching a puddle of blood expand beneath his ruined corpse. When I found I could stand no more, I sauntered inside and curled up under the bed. I instantly fell into a dreamless sleep. I woke up to the sound of singing, soft and tinkling, like the voice of a music box. It was coming from the woods. I slapped myself awake and pulled out the notebook, scanning the list of rules for one about the singing thing. I saw none. I grabbed a stubby pencil I'd found in the desk and made a note. 9. Something sings in the woods. Early evening. I would update later if I. I looked at rule number 8, the illegible graphite smudge, like it had been written then erased. I ran my finger over the back of the page and, sure enough, felt swirls and lines, writing indentations. I flattened out the page and gripped the pencil over the forgotten rule. I shaded slowly at first, not wanting to fudge the transfer. I flipped back the page and saw letters resolving out of paper pulp. It's a, I kept shading, slowly, diligently, checking my progress every so often. Five minutes later, I had rule number eight. It read, simply, it's a lie. We are the, that was all, six words with no meaning at all. I sighed and fell back on the empty bed frame. I turned to face the woods, deep in though, trees yawned to the horizon, and back again, an ocean of pines and firs as far as the eye could see, a great nothing, a great nothing. I had an idea. I booted up my laptop and called open Google Maps. I wouldn't be leaving until I found my dog, but I might as well prepare myself for the landscape. It pinwheeled for a minute, too, then, nothing. I saw a blue dot presumably me painted on an endless white grid. There were no coordinates, no roads, or rivers, no woods or mountains, just horizontal and vertical lines, nothing at all. I collapsed the laptop and found myself laughing. It was a manic, humorless sound, but I couldn't help myself. This was all too perfect. It really was. Hikers who tried to kill you, tree monsters missing dogs. It was a regular laugh riot. I could feel myself starting to crack, could feel the tears nibbling at my eyes, threatening to. There was a sound I didn't recognize. It was foreign after a week of nothing, but strange cries, creaking wood, leaves rattling in the wind. It was a bark. I shot up and rushed over to the window. I peered down at the ground below, expecting disappointment, expecting some mangy mutt nipping at a squirrel. Instead, I saw a rust-colored border collie at the tree line. I saw my dog, Alabama. I took the stairs two at a time. The wind flew through me as I belted down the tower and out onto flat ground. Alabama yipped happily and lurched toward me, but her leash snapped taut, holding her back. I slowed, my eyes widening. There was someone holding her leash. My neck prickled with dread as I scanned the shadows cast by ancient trees. Then, a man stepped out of the gloom. He was old, older than the land, a wild thing with crazy eyes, and a huge, scraggly beard, his clothes patched and mended. But no, his eyes weren't crazed, they were mild, and leveled at mine. They were filled with humanity. For you, I heard myself ask. He smiled, it lit up his whole face. I'm the one who started that list, said the ancient mountain man, as I nuzzled my dog 
and she nuzzled back. He looked past me, his face wrinkling as he peered at the twisted, bleeding corpse of the hiker crumpled just past the tower. What happened there? He asked. A good work of that poor fella, I see. I frowned. I thought but he's an imitator, right? I glanced at the gory tableau then looked away, my stomach roiling. Right, right, an imitator, the old man mused. Suddenly, and without fanfare, he turned from me and strode back into the woods, pulling my dog along with him. Best we go now, he called back. There's sure to be more. I hesitated, not wanting to leave the safety and sunlight of the clearing for the quiet gloom of the crowded woods. But he had my dog, and maybe it was time I finally get answers. I learned the meaning of rule number eight not long after. So you were the first, I asked as he had led me up a narrow, overgrown trail, which carved through the clutter of mother nature. It was a constant obstacle course, skirting rotting logs and felled branches. That's right, he said. It was a long, long time ago. I, he trailed off like his thought had wandered off, before he'd caught it, an awkward silence settled in. I cleared my throat. How'd you meet Mr. Aberdeen? Mister, he frowned. Kent Aberdeen, the guy. I gestured back at the tower. Oh, yes, of course. That was a lifetime ago. A lifetime. I looked around. The woods fell away, shifting into an endless riot of trees and brush warring for space. Where are we going? I asked. He stopped in his tracks so suddenly that I nearly plowed headlong into his bony back. I saw he was staring off into nothing, head cocked slightly, as if listening to a whisper that only he heard. My heart slowly rose and my chest from a low, steady trot into a loud, thundering gallop. Something was wrong. This wasn't right at all. I looked at Alabama, and she looked back, her leash still coiled around his fist. I had some questions about the list, I said, trying to keep the fear from my voice. There was a rule. Number eight. It was scribbled out. It said, it's a lie. We are the, we are the wicked ones. He snarled in a jagged voice. My heart jolted dizzyingly. I looked up and the old man looked back, eyes feral and hungry, mouth split into a crooked sneer that displayed not enough teeth. What? I asked, my voice coming from a distant place. We are the wicked ones, he said again, slowly advancing on me. We are all the wicked ones. Time is a flat circle by which all things, good and bad, abide. We have always been, and will always be, and you will join us, like those before and after, and together we will all ride off into the final midnight. His eyes swam back into his head, clouding into ugly white marbles, as the tight, pink seam set into his untamed beard tore apart, first into an agonized, toothy grimace, then descending into something else entirely. It was as though invisible hands were tearing his mouth apart, pulling it far wider than any mouth should go. Alabama yipped and snapped against her leash which was cemented in one crooked claw, his long, bony fingers curled inward like a dead spider. Fingers that were, crackling, expanding, growing long and jagged as the rest of the wicked one grew with it. He expanded before me. Bony, slumped shoulders rose higher with a series of sickening crackles, and pops, and legs, as narrow, and knobby as a horse's, grew into tall, uneven stilts. It towered above me, a malnourished beast hiding behind a scraggly beard, its face, cheeks hollow and emaciated, pulled into a wide, frozen scream. I felt my legs buckle as I looked past him and saw the others. Half a dozen wicked ones watched me from the woods, men and women, young and old, mouths wide in silent agony, the ones who came before. A dry wheeze, the sound of a mummy surrendering its soul, sighed out of the old man's mouth. I stood there frozen and raw, tingling terror until Alabama howled. Her cry of despair, the one that said, I'm scared, I want to go, slapped me into motion. I grasped my dog's harness and dispatched the leash. She belted off down the trail as the wicked ones broke into movement. I ran for all mankind. My legs steamed beneath me, pumping on some automatic function that was buried deep within my lizard brain. I could feel them whisking after me, could picture their jagged, bony legs blurring through the landscape as they flew through the forest like an autumn breeze. I was in the clearing before I knew it. My dog wasn't. I stood there for a sickening moment, looking around as my stomach tottered dizzily at the lip of a drop. Then I saw a flash of rust. It was Alabama bounding up the tower stairs, three at a time. I fell in after her, hitting the first step and then the next, and then the next, and then the, 
My foot plunged through a rotten plank, snaring me a quarter way up the tower. I glanced back and saw the wicked ones. With a cry, I wrenched my foot free. The rotten plank fell away, spiraling down to the ground as I planted my feet and lunged upward. I hit one landing after the next, circling the tower as I ran for everything I was worth. Without breaking stride, I glanced down and saw, oh god, like a family of giant spiders, the wicked ones clawed their way up the tower, half of them free climbing the side, the other half flooding up the stairs. I staggered the rest of the way up with my lungs screaming and my heart drowning. My chest fell full of hot lead, lead which made the world around me throb like a living thing. The burning stitch in my side flared angrily as I threw open the cabin door and burst inside. Alabama was coiled beneath the bed, a high, frightened growl brewing in the back of her throat. I grabbed the notebook. As the watchtower shook and groaned, they were nearly here. My eyes blurred over the list of rules, scanning for a way to defeat them. Three, but where the wicked ones? I've only seen them once. I'm not sure what purpose they serve. They haven't bothered me. There was nothing. No weakness. No Achilles heel to be severed. Nothing but the megaphone. Rule number six said that such a thing would flee at the frequency of a megaphone. And since I didn't have a sawed off shotgun shoved down my pants, I lunged for the megaphone dangling from a peg on the wall. Just as a wicked one exploded through the window, glass erupted in a shimmering cloud as the thing tore its way inside. Alabama issued a high growl and lunged, clamping her jaws around the wicked one's bony ankle. This one was a woman, tall and skeletal, her face the distended O of a silent scream. My dog thrashed her head with the fervor of a starving beast on an injured elk. The wicked one moaned and batted one elongated limb at Alabama. It impacted her side with the muffled crack of an axe splitting a log and sent her flying across the room. Alabama hammered one wall with a startled cry and crumpled limply to the ground. No, I roared as I stripped the megaphone off the wall. The wicked one whipped toward me, eyes dumb and blind, limbs flickering like jointed tentacles. I gripped the mouthpiece, keyed the button, and stuffed it next to the cone. A deafening whine filled the cabin, an ear-splitting wall of noise which drove out everything else. The wicked one flew back with a high shriek, its body crumpling in on itself as it tried to escape the inescapable. It floundered, tripped, and went tumbling outside as its body, its tall, wicked body, began to shrivel, wither, waste away before my eyes. Viscous black fluid, the color of death, flowed from its eyes, nose, and ears. Droplets of fluid hit the ground and sizzled eating through the wood like fast acting acid. Without thinking I blew outside, the megaphone held forward like a crucifix in a warding off gesture. Two wicked ones, one pumping up over the tower railing, the other staggering up the stairs, wheezed back, hands going to their heads, bodies trembling as they recoiled from the noise. The instantly withered like slugs on hot asphalt, bodies disintegrating into wrinkled sheets as fluid ran from every orifice. The one on the tower railing pinwheeled back and disappeared over the side. The other folded down the tower stairs like a puppet with cut strings, spraying black goo as it went. Goo which immediately disintegrated all it touched. I watched, frozen and stunned, as the wicked one's blood burned away the staircase like it was flash paper. The others had fled. On the ground below, I saw crooked, uneven shapes disappearing into the tree line. But I couldn't move, couldn't look away. I was transfixed. I stood and stared as blood that burned like acid ate through the stairwell. By the time it had stopped, half of the stairs had melted away. I found myself stranded atop the tower, with no way of getting down. I was shipwrecked in a sea of trees, half of the tower stairs having burned away with the life of the wicked ones. I was completely alone, alone with nothing, and no one to. A whine cut through my despair. At first I thought it must have been the wind, hooting up and around the tower, but then it came again. I was in motion before I knew it. I lurched inside the ruined cabin, the one with blown out windows and scattered acid holes in the floor and looked around. At first I didn't see her. I squinted against the hellish flare of sunlight bouncing off broken glass. Alabama was right. Where I'd left her, crumpled on the floor in a loose, lifeless heap, a wave of emotion slammed through my chest. I started to cry. Huge, body racking sobs tore through me as I realized she isn't alive. I had just been imagining it. I cried until Alabama tilted her head and offered a low, forlorn whine. 
The tears came harder, sweeping through me in a great flood as I rushed to her side, absently skirting one of the fist-sized holes, and swept her up into my arms. She planted slobbery kisses on my cheeks as I buried my face in her fur, pulling a deep lungful of damp dog scent the way a smoker might inhale their first cigarette of the day, and sob. She allowed it for all of five seconds before wriggling out of my grasp. Alabama found her footing, cautiously eased forward, testing for pain, and finding none, then leapt atop the bed. She had a slight limp, but was otherwise her usual, goofy self. So that was us, two wounded soldiers trapped on the battlefield, the tide of war having momentarily pulled back. We ate dinner in silence, her slurping up a healthy serving of canned people food, and me having just the same. Afterwards, I updated the rulebook for all the good that would do one, and watched darkness scrub away the light. I tried to sleep, found I couldn't, but tried anyway. God knows I'd need it. Come first light. I was going to war. The first of dawn marched in like an enemy force, and I was ready. I double-checked my makeshift armor, and took stock of my supplies. Thick rope, megaphone, Swiss army knife, first aid kit, lighter fluid, Zippo lighter, crumpled pack of Marlboro Reds food and water. Check, check, check. I moved outside the cabin and peered over the outer railing. The ground tore away from me, reminding me that this was a horrible idea. If I screwed up, I'd plummet to my death. And this was a horrible idea. I dropped down the duffel bag of supplies before I lost my nerve. I had padded the inside with a blanket and it hit the ground with a muffled thump. Next came us, Alabama, double wrapped in a heavy quilted blanket was roped to my chest like a baby in a papoose. She whined as I looped the rope around my legs and armpits in an ersatz harness. I double-checked the tether, making sure the rope was properly secured to cabin's doorframe. Then it was time to go. Time to go. I swallowed dryly, pulled myself up over the railing, coiled the rope around my fists, and leaned back all the way, my body weight counterbalanced by my feet. Alabama clung to my abdomen like a warm, smoldering log, resting comfortably between stomach and legs as I slowly took the first step backward, then the next, and the next, about 20 feet above the ground. I'd hit a stretch of stairs that hadn't dissolved, but that still left me a 50-odd feet of dead, empty air. The rope slid through my hands, grinding against the thin t-shirt fabric protecting my palms. As I slowly descended, my back to the ground, the top of the tower slowly pulling away from me, I worked my way down, 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 crack, the rope tore loose, and I fell, plummeted like a brick as the top of the tower ripped away from me, the frayed end of my lifeline whipping through the air like a dead snake. I hit the stairs, and erupted through them, Alabama howling in my ear, clawing, and squirming at my chest like a bag of weasels. The ground flew through us like a freight train. There was the crunch of bone as darkness shot through my mind like an ice pick. Then there was only black. Alabama was dead. Not missing in the woods, not unconscious, dead. She must have broken my fall, saved my life. I had awoken, head throbbing, right eye knotted shut, bound to a tree. Thick, wax rope bit into my legs, chest, neck. My hands were glued to my side. My heart hammered heavily in my narrow ribcage. Tears, hot and salty, poured down my cheeks. And all I felt was a deep, steady heartbreak, like a manic gnome was needling at my insides with a smoldering poker. I didn't see Kent Aberdeen standing over me. I didn't see the watchtower, punching at the sky like a wooden fist. All I saw was Alabama's limp, crooked head spilling out of the bundle that was supposed to carry her to safety. It didn't have to be like this, Aberdeen said. I brewed a snot ball, and spat it at him along with a hiss. Screw you. He deftly stepped aside, and shook his head. No, he said. It'll all be over soon. Eat a deep fried ass. He chuckled at that. You're doing a good thing he said, and I'll have her back, Amelia. He sounded febrile, like his battered mind had finally split in two under the great axe of isolation. What are you saying? It doesn't much matter anymore, he said with a sigh. Just know you're making a great sacrifice. In the name of another life, a red ball of anger manifested in my gut, slowly boiling into a white hot rage. Tell me, I screamed. Tell me why she's dead. I started to sob, sob for everything that had happened, for my dead dog. For the ruin of my life, Aberdeen looked at me, and in his eyes I saw not a man living in the shadow of murder and psychopathy, but of pain and sorrow. You were supposed to be the last, he said quietly, the last, 
You were never going to leave. None of them were, but you were supposed to be the last. Why, I groaned, voice a hoarse whisper. Why, he swallowed. This place, it's like no other. It's a foul jungle, an animal kingdom corrupted by dark ideas. But why, I pleaded. He opened his mouth to answer, paused, the words trapped in his throat. He was looking past me now, face wrinkled with confusion. What? He started, bemused. No, no, this wasn't the deal. There was a loud crunch from the woods to my back, the sound of movement. Getting closer, Aberdeen's eyes swam with horror. Where is she? Aberdeen cried to the quiet. Afternoon. Where's my daughter? Fleck. A vine shot past me and disappeared through Aberdeen's eye. A spray of brain, skull, and silver hair erupted from the back of his skull. He collapsed into a slack pile of limbs as the sharp, jagged vine, studded with thorns and drenched in gore, withdrew from his eye socket with a wet crackle. I held still while my heart thundered against my ribs, desperate to escape, but we were both trapped, forced to watch as four massive shapes emerged from the woods. Tree talkers. They looked like men, giant, swollen men, born of the forest, effigies made of leaves, bark, moss that seemed to shift, and ripple like a reflection on water, each of them bearing a strange optical illusion, where they only took on the familiar shape of men. When faced head on, they stood before me and stared, their lifeless eyes like trapped ponds, ones which didn't obey the laws of physics. Their bodies pulsed, throbbed, breathed as if they themselves were comprised of many living things. One of them raised his hand. The thorny vine of his index finger snaked forth, slithered around my leg in a slimy caress, then devoured my ropes. I fell forward, my body one cruel ache, vibrating with fear, rage, and a deep-rooted fatigue that seemed to sap my strength. Rough hands made of bark and vine grabbed my shoulders, hands behind which lived a terrible strength, one that could snap me like a rotting branch in a heartbeat. I didn't fight as I was dragged off into the woods. My gaze stayed with my dog, a final act of solidarity until she disappeared from view. I never saw the rust-colored border collie named Alabama again. The woods were normal until they weren't. Strange, otherworldly trees crept in, imposters among the ones I knew. Thick walls of brush, a deep purple flecked with gold, drew together. Huge black birds with red eyes went beating to the sky like spray from a shotgun. As the tree talkers pulled me through the woods, I was dragged until the idea of normal forest was lost in my mind, replaced by the alien jungle that now occupied my world, the one that seemed to breathe and watch us pass, the creatures whose footfalls sounded like trees creaking in the wind, the ones who didn't speak at all, despite their name, dragged me as the normal sky fell away and a deep overcast took its place. I thought I saw a lone structure in the distance, a log cabin engulfed by thick, purple vines. Then it wiped from view and I saw nothing but the woods. Heinous, alien woods. It was that way for a while. My limp body dragged along, heels digging trenches in the soil, a thin trail of lighter fluid leaking after us. As I surreptitiously squeezed the bottle empty, I gripped the Zippo lighter in my pocket. It felt warm familiar, the only thing keeping me rooted as I was forced through the forest and into the impossible kingdom. There I was received by the Queen of Trees, who met me with a deadly proposal, and I realized, with a sudden pang of horror, that the real nightmare had only just begun. I was dragged into a wide clearing fenced by a crude wall of trees, as though the flora itself dare not encroach this sacred territory. The jungle snarled away from us in colorful streaks, Deep purples, dark magentas, and muddy pinks colored the vines, leaves, and bark. It felt like a room, a throne room, one enclosed by growth on four sides. I looked up, thick canopies of branches, interwoven like a tapestry, formed a loose ceiling. The tree talkers shoved me to the ground. A wall of pain slammed through my knees and trickled up my thighs, slowly settling into my gut like an icy marble. Something was broken. Something was definitely broken. Tears singed my eyes. I bit back a scream and focused my gaze, finding the dull, colorful vines, each as thick as my forearm, that carpeted the ground. They ran like petrified snakes toward the middle of the room, where they swelled up, spiraled, and formed the throne. That was where she sat in all her dreadful glory, the queen of trees. She was graceful, like a woman in her sixties who had been touched by flawless genes. Hair smooth, startling silver, face bracketed by nearly imperceptible wrinkles, 
She looked like an old Hollywood icon, timeless in her dress of golden leaves, each shimmering as if painstakingly dipped in liquid gold. Amelia, I groaned. It was all that came to me. She must be Aberdeen's Amelia, the one he was so desperate to get back. The Queen of Trees smiled at me. It sent a cold shiver itching down my spine. It was a dead smile, lifeless. Yes, she said, her voice the sound of ice breaking. This is about her, isn't it? I frowned. My mind seemed occupied by an enemy force, one made of black fog that clouded my thoughts and made the world hazy. Why am I here? I asked, my voice a hoarse croak. Why did Aberdeen bring me here? Her eyebrows drew together in what was either irritation or amusement. Her face, as stony and cold as a slab of marble, made reading her emotions impossible. Then she smiled one of her dead, lifeless smiles. Now there's a name I haven't heard aloud in a long, long while, she said. I looked at her. Who are you? Her eyes bored through me, unamused. I'm the queen of trees, she said. But before that, well, that was a long, long time ago. Tell me, I groaned. It was another life. Really, the queen of trees replied. But I suppose you'll want to hear it all. She paused as if trying to keep the words from her lips. Aberdeen, a fool, the man I knew a lifetime ago, who kept me in chains, kept me from my fate. She spat. I knew him, but he never knew me. A foolish little man corrupted by what he could not see. My husband. I sat on the jagged ground as golden beetles scuttled between my feet and listened to her tell her tale. Long ago there was a family, a happy family, one with loud, exciting lives in the city. The man had a busy job, and his wife had a job of her own, raising their daughter. All was well, as it should be, until it wasn't. Dark ideas slithered in like vines, between the cracks of what was a happy woman's mind, driving a wedge between man, wife, and child. The man tried everything to bring back the woman he knew, but nothing worked. At ends, he decided to move his family away from the concrete jungle, the one that had seemed to infect his wife like a disease. He searched near and far for a new place to lay roots, settling on a distant land that lived across the ocean. He bought them a cabin in the woods, hoping a healthy dose of nature would burn away the bad still infesting his wife's mind. And it did. But what the man didn't realize was that new thoughts had replaced the old ones, thoughts far worse than any thoughts should be. The woman had come to know something, something not even he would have believed. Destiny had driven her here. Her fate, as told by whispers in the wind and trees, was to lead a rotting kingdom out of the darkness and into the light. So she took her daughter to the kingdom, leaving the man, whose false good will have been the source of her malady all along, to wither and rot like the cabin in the woods. And so she ruled in quiet glory for many years, until she fell ill. Her kingdom began to die, corrupted by sickness. Bad things trickled in like slimy, diseased water infesting her utopia and turning it foul. She knew it was time her daughter claimed the throne, but the young girl, now of age, was innocent of dark ideas. She was weak, and she would need a partner to rule alongside her. So the woman, too sick to find a suitor herself, made false promises to the graying man she once knew. Find me someone and you can have her back. She lied. The man brought one, then many, but each and all were corrupted by the bad things that now hid in the shadows of her kingdom. The woman continued her search for years, growing weaker by the day, and still she found no one to rule by her daughter's side, until the boy with the dog, the one who defeated the crooked beasts that moved like shadows and fed off light. He was the one for her daughter. I was. I looked up at her, and she looked down at me, her crown of black and gold thorns glinting in the light. She waited for me to speak. I cleared my throat, wiped the film of sweat off my brow. Can I think about it? I said. Her lips drew back over bone white teeth in an ugly snarl. It's written, she said, in blood and death. Your fate, like mine, was cast upon you the moment you entered this world. Every decision you've ever made has led you here. You were born to stand before me. Jesus Christ, I thought, this woman is positively batshit. I glanced around and saw we were alone. But no, we weren't at all. The camouflaged shapes of tree talkers etched themselves out of the growth on either side. They stood silent sentry, waiting for orders. My eyes shot over my shoulder, trying to find the portal that had led us here, but the room had closed off. Past the queen's throne stood the same, but the growth behind her was withered, shriveled, dried out, like the world around us was bearing the symptoms of the queen's illness. 
I had no choice. I'll do it, I said, fighting to my feet with a grimace. Let the lovely bride accept my hand. The queen smiled her dead smile, reading the deep, bitter sarcasm in my words. I wouldn't try any foolery, she said. You haven't yet known the feeling of vines, vines as thin as thread, forcing their way through every vein, capillary, and artery in your meat husk. You wouldn't die, no, because I wouldn't let you. You wouldn't die until the network of tubes pumping red life through your bones had been replaced by bark. I tried not to shudder. One thing, I said, feeling up my pockets in an act of garish pantomime. I didn't bring any rings, metal or otherwise. The queen found no humor in this. She simply cocked her head and issued a single word, Amelia. The princess stepped out from behind the throne, and my heart caught in my throat. She was stunning, no older than twenty with lawn, black hair, her skin a milky white, her lips warm and pink. She wore a black slip, one that seemed woven of anti-light, like her dress itself, was made of shadow. Yes, mother, she said in a slack, monotonous voice. Her eyes, glazed and distant, seemed not to see, as though she were in a kind of trance. The queen of trees, speaking in her cold, flat voice, told Amelia of the circumstance, before beckoning me forth. Good lord, I thought, this is insane. I leant forward. The queen of trees regarded me distrustfully until I took one of her daughter's hands. And mine. Amelia, I said, swallowing the lump in my throat. She looked up at me, eyes clearing, brow furrowing. A bolt of awareness seemed to clip through her. A girl coming out of coma. Oh, she started. Can you run? I asked, my heart picking up pace. The queen of trees shot to her feet. Stop that at once, she cried. Can you run? I asked Amelia again. Stop that now. The queen roared. I knew your father, I said, fumbling in my pocket. Kent Aberdeen. Your father, Amelia, do you remember? The queen of trees shouted something. I caught a blur of movement on both sides as her guards surged toward us. My father, Amelia said, face flushing with color as long forgotten memories fought to the surface. Your father, I said, he died for you. Now answer me. Can you run? Her eyes focused on mine, seeing me, understanding what I was asking. Yes, she said, I think I can. A bottle of lighter fluid was up and out in an instant. A stream of yellow sprang from its spigot as I squeezed the last of its guts over the queen of trees. She staggered back, momentarily stunned. Close your eyes, I said to the girl in black. The zippo ignited with a satisfying click. I flicked it. It spiraled through the air, flame guttering, silver case flashing a wink of light. It touched the queen of trees, merely kissed her, and she went up in flame. The throne room ignited the instant she did with a hot whoosh. Walls of fire shot up from the ground, first tasting the trees, then devouring them. The tree talkers erupted then crumpled like flaming effigies as their queen shrieked. The high, skin crawling sound of something dreadful dying in the embrace of flame. I grabbed Amelia and pulled her into motion. Pain lanced through my shin. As we fell into a run, I cried out and tripped forward. Hands caught me, pulled me to my feet, and dragged me into an agonized limp run. Amelia, the girl imprisoned by the woods, was free. Ahead of us, the wall that had been sealed over by a knot of tree trunks had pulled apart. The queen's dark magic was dying. With her flaming branches and leaves danced through the air like hellish snow. As we disappeared from the throne room, and into the jungle beyond. We ran as fire licked up the trail behind us, eating through the drying stream of lighter fluid I'd left behind like breadcrumbs. I cried. It was all I could do. I think she cried too, because the world tasted like salt and ash and salvation as we ran from the kingdom in flames. You may think you know the ending, but you don't. This isn't a fairy tale, and it doesn't end the way it should. We don't stagger to safety having beat the odds. Two newly minted heroes who have slayed the dragon. I don't sweep her off her feet and pull her into a long, passionate kiss. Hell, I just burned her mother alive. And besides, this is the real world. Things don't ever happen the way they should and rarely do stories, especially these, have a happy ending. So you'll have to decide how it ends for yourself. I will tell you we escaped the nightmarish jungle. We limped through strange trees and clusters of brush as a raging sea of flame galloped at our heels. We passed the distant cabin, the one devoured by roots and vines, the one meant as a new beginning for a family fractured by dark ideas. We ran as the woods shifted from a colorful collage into an earthy green tapestry, the woods I knew. We ran until we hit a clearing from which grew a wooden watchtower. 
Alabama was gone and so was Kent Aberdeen. That hurt the most. I wish she could have been here with me when the army of flame reached our little desert island. It's closer now, the fire. Columns of smoke rise from the woods, choking the sky of its blue innocence. The sun burns a deep blood red through the ashy gauze. That red sun, like Satan's eye watching us from a stolen heaven, makes me think this story won't have a happy ending. But I'll let you decide. Maybe we leave the tower behind, the one that stands above me as I write this now, and fight our way through the woods, me limping, her dragging me along. Maybe we find a road, the one that leads to Duty's diner. Maybe we sit in the booth, where I first met her father, and talk about a world she doesn't know over coffee and pie. But I don't think it ends that way. It's much too warm. For happy endings, I can see the flames marching closer, a wall of heat announcing the fire's arrival like the breath of a dragon. The queen was right about one thing. Everything I've ever done has led me to this moment. But she was wrong about the ending. No one gets to write it for me. Only I can do that. I guess it's time I get to work.